Dr. Caroline Binder. And Dr. Binder completed her PhD in physical oceanography from Dalhousie University in 2017. And uh, since 2014, she has been working as a defense scientist um, at Defense Research and Development Canada, uh, where she applies her expertise to projects involving marine mammal monitoring, uh, impacts of active sonar, Arctic underwater acoustic surveillance, and uh, applications of machine learning to ocean acoustics. Um, Carolyn, please get started. Wonderful, thank you. Let's pop up my screen here. Uh, so let me know that you're seeing the right screen, the one with the, the big screen. Yes, looks right. right. Perfect. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to kind of fly through a bunch of things here, covering a lot of um, a lot of ground. Um, this is kind of a good, uh, I'm kind of a good, in a good place here where I think I'm going to connect some of the stuff between some of the marine mammal stuff that we were listening to um, earlier in the, in the first session, as well as some of the um, more ship-based stuff that we're going to that looks like people are going to talk about later on. Okay, I'm going to take a step back because um, I kind of assumed that this was a mix of computer science as well as acoustics people. So I'm just going to set up the stage here so that we're all on kind of the same page with some ocean acoustics basics. So I'm going to be talking both about passive sonar and active sonar throughout my talk. This is the passive sonar equation. Um, everything's in dB, all addition, subtraction, so a super easy equation to throw up. Um, so when you make a recording at a hydrophone, um, you're looking at the signal in, in terms of the signal to noise ratio. And what that really depends on is the source level of the signal. Um, some things are nice and always produce the same source level all the time. Other things like whales will kind of have this variable um, source level as we, as um, depending on, I don't know, how they feel or whether they want to talk loud or not. Um, transmission loss, which um, describes how the sound level changes. Um, as the um, signal is transmitted in range and can incorporate a lot of different propagation effect types of things. Um, then we've got the noise level. So that's a description of the background um, ambient noise level. Um, again, a very complicated term. Um, and the directivity index, which is the um, sometimes called array gain. And that's the advantage that you get by being able to listen to sound in a specific direction and exclude all the noise from, from other directions. Um, the active sonar equation looks very similar, um, except because with, a, with active sonar, you're sending a signal out and listening um, for the return off of some target that's out there. So you're listening for the echoes. Um, in this case, we're concerned more about the two-way transmission loss. So basically double the propagation effects. Um, and there's also a, a term in here that describes the target strength. So basically how much energy is being reflected back um, from, um, from the target. Um, so digging into that transmission loss term just a little bit more, um, this describes a whole array of different things. Um, sound in the ocean is very complicated. It rarely travels in a straight path due to reflection from boundaries or refraction because of the, the sound speed profile. It's location and season dependent, um, largely based on, on the sound speed profiles, um, which have to do with different water mass properties. So in terms of machine learning, what this means to us is that proper, uh, propagation boundary interactions distort the recorded signal because of all these different multipath additions or um, even a more modal type of a, um, approach. So um, that noise term um, gives us uh, ambient noise, which again is location, season dependent, frequency dependent, different between deep water, shallow water. Um, I do a lot of work in the Arctic where the ambient noise profiles can be incredibly different. So what this really means is it impacts our detection of signals because of the characteristics of both the signal and the noise. Um, so from a, a machine learning point of view, we need to be able to detect a signal in variable noise conditions, um, which uh, for a lot of the work that I do, um, we often require low SNR detection. Um, and we don't want a lot of false positives from the ambient noise background. So those are things to be keeping in mind. Um, this is my last slide on ocean acoustic basics. Um, so we've got, I think we all kind of understand hydrophones are what record 
um, underwater sound. But what I wanted to, the point I wanted to get across here is all the different types of sensors, even though they're hydrophones, we use to record sounds. Everything from sit fixed sensors to very mobile autonomous sensors. Um, I work with the Air Force quite a bit and they use sonoboys, which they deploy from aircraft. They can kind of freely drift and like their duration is kind of six to eight hours. So they're out dropping sonoboys in lots of different locations, um, but always kind of looking for similar types of targets. Um, in this case, largely submarines. Um, and then we've got these bigger kind of more powerful sensors, um, which are arrays. So um, like typically line arrays of many hydrophones, either from um, that get towed from a vessel or um, can be static as a seabed array. So again, um, variability, these different recording systems all have different characteristics and themselves pr can produce different noise profiles, whether that's mooring noise or flow noise. All right, shifting into some of the marine mammal stuff, I'm glad I reorganized my talk to put this first because it kind of um, mirrors the, the sessions here. So why does D&D care about uh, marine mammal monitoring? Um, typically, I guess a lot of people think of that as a DFO type of problem. Um, in our case, it's because environmental impacts of active sonar use can are known to lead to very se severe, consequence, severe consequences from behavioral impacts right up to death and stranding. Um, however, um, the Canadian Armed Forces need to go out, they need to train with active sonar. Um, so there's this requirement to balance these um, training requirements with the environmental risks of active sonar. So DRDC is assisting with research and technological developments, a big part of which has been um, real-time detection and classification systems. Not so much um, in-house development as assessing what's kind of out there and um, looking at how each of these different types of systems can be improved or integrated into a system of systems. Um, we're also looking at integrating historical data, model data, and real-time data to estimate the risks of marine mammals to marine mammals of, of act, active sonar activities. So the plot that I'm showing down here at the bottom um, is a spectrum of ambient noise recorded by um, sauna boys during um, one of their missions during which there was active sonar usage. And so this it's kind of a typical spectrum in a lot of ways. So the blue line is the 90th percentile, and that's where we actually see the impacts of sonar here, um, is that it really raises um, the background noise levels, causes these confounding signals. And what that means is that there, um, we looked at detection range modeling with this and saw that there was a large change in the minimum PAM detection ranges, even though the average ranges um, were kind of stayed about the same. So that's something we need to care about because a lot of the time we want to be detecting marine mammals in the presence of active sonar. Um, as I said, we've been exploring a lot of new sensing and detection technologies. Um, we've got a smart boy that's been deployed for about a year um, out on the West Coast in um, an anti-submarine warfare exercise area. Um, it was sending real-time alerts back using one of JASCO's ocean observer um, detection packages and also has some really interesting archival data that we've just got off the buoy and are starting to do some quality assurance on. Um, we've also looked at using autonomous systems like underwater gliders and unmanned surface vehicles um, for doing real-time monitoring before, during, and after sonar exercises. Um, again, the goal of that is to send alerts back in real time to be able to make decisions um, about whether there are marine mammals in the area of, of a sonar exercise. We've also started exploring um, some work looking at EOIR and satellite-based data, um, although that's a little bit newer to us and certainly not my area of expertise. Um, and of course, the thing that brings all of this together is machine learning and AI. Um, in particular, because we've got all these multimodal data sets, we're thinking about how we can fuse all of them and to be able to make better decisions, um, espe especially when we start looking at, you know, false detection rates, false positive rates, some data streams are more reliable, things like that. Okay, so that's just a really quick high level view of um, a lot of the work or some of the work that we've been doing over the last couple of years. Um, I've just thrown up a couple publications there if you want some more details on those, although we're always happy to take questions. Um, 
So shifting now into uh, what I consider a little bit more of the, the classic um, military space. Um, so I've broken this problem space down into a couple different places where I've been focusing my efforts. The first is in passive acoustic surveillance in remote communications limited environments. So think we wanna know if there are ships, submarines up in the Canadian Arctic, for example, um, that has its own set of challenges. The second problem space is that of sonar operators who need to monitor many different sensors simultaneously, potentially with many confounding um, signals. So I've shown an example here of um, some data that we've processed um, and have ready now to start looking at for machine learning. Um, this was an ASW exercise um, in 2016 called Cutlass Fury. Um, and it had many different active sonar transmissions from ships, so hull-mounted sonars, as well as um, sonoboy, active source sonoboys and helicopter dipping sonars. Um, the plots that I'm showing on the map here are actually from 17 different Aurora sorties where they've dropped sonoboys just off the, um, just in the deep water off Scotian shelf over a course of about a week in 2016, where mission durations range from half an hour to four and a half hours um, and boys ranging from one to 57 boys per mission. It's a lot of data, a lot of data that sonar operators need to be looking at, and that's just from the aircraft. And they're dropping them near other vessels that are transmitting at the same time. So there's, they have to sort out which signals they're interested in, which are the targets that they're looking for, and which are just um, other, other vessels that aren't of interest to them because they're cooperative um, targets. So um, we've been doing a lot of thinking over the last year, couple of years um, about where machine learning and AI could be applied to these types of problems. There's lots of, lots of space for machine learning and AI. Um, so I've broken it down into kind of four different bigger categories here um, where the first one is um, the difference, looking at the difference between passive and active sonar. Um, so again, that's the difference between just listening to something and not knowing what's out there at all versus active sonar, which you're sending out a ping and what you're listening for is the echoes, the returns coming back. There might be a target or it might just be a bunch of rocks out there that you're getting um, returns from. So what this really means is there, there are different pre-processing steps um, with these cases. I don't think you're ever gonna want to feed just a raw time series from active sonar, for example, but maybe you do with, with passive, passive um, sonar. Um, we incorporate contextual cues differently, and there is a big difference in the types of signals that are coming in. Um, the second category is autonomous and remote data, where um, we have a lot of constraints because of the types of um, sensors that we can have deployed there. Um, it's typically a lot of embedded or onboard processing. You can't have a human in the loop because these are really communications limited environments. Typically there's a lot of, um, um, you're gonna be working with low processing power systems. And this is a case where automation is, is really critical and it's automation kind of end to end. And you don't want a lot of false positives because all of a sudden your comms bills go up through the roof. Um, then there's a big data problem um, where we're getting these large volumes of data that's being streamed in, um, sometimes in, in near real time, it needs to be processed in real time. So for example, seabed arrays that have 48 <laughs> sensors on them and you got two of those, or you've got, we've, um, we have some examples of, um, uh, we're actually trialing a seabed array that's a kilometer and a half long. So with a lot of different sensors on it. Again, a big problem. Um, and then there's a, the case of, we got some sonar operators out there, out there right now. Um, they've got all these different data streams coming in. So for example, on the aircraft, um, they can deploy up to 32 sonar boys at a time. And they, they're monitoring those different boys um, all kind of simultaneously. So this is a place where we might be able to look at an idea of an operator assistant where you can kind of ping and say, look, there's um, a signal of interest over here. Um, maybe you should go look at that. And that's really a case of where we could have a human in the loop, may, possibly a baby step, but it would be actually um, a, a very useful case. Um, so now on to some of the challenges. We kind of 
um, uh, some of the presenters early in the day have already touched on a lot of these. Um, we all kind of know that machine learning needs representative data sets. And this is one of the cases that um, makes ocean acoustics, I think, particularly challenging because there's, as I mentioned earlier in this talk, all of these different sources of variability in ocean acoustic data, whether it comes from the environment, the level of SNR, even the complexity of the data. So for example, a recorder in the Arctic, you might have one ship going by it at a time. Whereas during one of these big ASW events, you've got multiple ships out there, multiple, um, multiple pinging. Um, so how representative do these data sets need to be? Um, we also, particularly um, in D&D, have an issue with labeled data sets. Um, this is something that we were trying to overcome more and more. Um, we certainly have lots of expertise in labeling data sets with the sonar operators, but they do it in a way that's a lot different, I would say, than what a machine learning person would need as input for their, their systems. And so we're working on trying to link those two different things together. Um, and I've just raised the point here that even though, even if you are using an unsupervised learning system, um, having labeled data sets is still gonna be important for validation of those, those systems. Um, data management, I think that's always a problem <laughs> no matter where you are. Uh, the data needs to be discoverable, understandable by someone other than the researchers um, that collected the data. Um, in many of my cases, I have issues with significant class skew, particularly with um, trying to find submarines and data. You have many more examples of the negative class, whether that's noise or um, false alarms from, from clutter targets with active sonar. Um, and so this might be an opportunity for, for data augmentation. Um, contextual data is also something that I've been thinking a lot about. Um, we've been talking to human sonar operators or um, experienced acoustic analysts who, um, when you talk to them about how they make classification decisions, they use many different clues in the data that's surrounding um, a signal of interest to make a classification decision. So that what they're doing is building up a picture. They're not just kind of honing in on one small segment of data. And I think that's something that um, there's some interesting stuff that's starting to come out now in the machine learning world about how about the connectedness of these different pieces of data that you're feeding into a machine learning system. And of course, I can't help but mention the fact that we have a classification problem. So um, sonar data, you can imagine, I can't just freely share <laughs> with the wide world. Um, so while I don't wanna belabor that point, it is a limiting factor in opening up some of these data sets to really try out some of these new novel methods. And so what we're trying to do is figure out how to, how to um, figure out what we can do with these unclassified data sets that we do have access to um, to make it easier to work and collaborate with, and then figure out how we can transfer those results to into the classified um, data sets. So as I mentioned, we have been doing a lot of work um, over the last couple of years with labeling data sets. This is some work that um, Geospectrum has done a lot of, a lot of for me as well as um, JASCO. Um, so what we've been doing so far is looking at data from an assortment of recording conditions to facilitate developing um, these robust detection, classification, localization, and training algorithms, or DCLT for short, um, because we want to avoid developing algorithms that are tuned to a specific environment or recorder type. Um, we want to make sure that we're not getting just the greatest hits, um, by which I mean we don't want super all this high SNR calls that have no confounding signals in it, um, which is what um, we had been saving, D&D had been saving for, for a long time. Um, but they're starting to shift now as they see that the value of machine learning. Um, so I think we're starting, we're setting ourselves up more and more for being able to jump deep into machine learning. It's a um, in its heads up. Okay, yeah. Perfect. So uh, I just have a couple example results here um, from some work that I've been doing. Um, this is a simulation study looking at um, classifier performance as a function of signal and noise ratio in the noise only case. So you can see we go from good performance down to like essentially randomly assigning classification decision at low SNR and kind of this nice smooth transition for the, for the noise only case. Then you add in the effects of propagation. So here I just transmitted um, some signals through, an, um, through a pulse propagation model. And this was an Arctic environment where things get much more complicated and they're no longer, performance is no longer a clear function of either um, SNR or range. Uh, 
oopsie, there we go. Um, so in this case, it looks like the large scale trend tend, seems to be related to SNR where the smaller scale um, trend is related to the distortion called by, uh, caused by propagation. Um, we also have some uh, new and exciting results from an Arctic seabed array. So that's one that we got de deployed up in um, the Northwest Passage. Um, Jess Topple has been doing most of this work um, with several of us um, kind of helping shape what she's been doing. Um, so uh, she's been taking eight seconds of data, um, either time series data or spectrogram data from all 48 hydrophones, putting them through a deep learning classifier of some type. And that's where her research is, is really looking at what's going to work and outputting a classification decision that's predicting the classification of the ships that are present. Um, the Northwest Passage is really interesting because we typically see the same ships going there through there back and forth on a semi-regular basis of, um, year over year. So she, she's gotten to the point that she can classify down to the, um, down to the ship. So um, just quickly, her results from one of her um, custom uh, convolutional neural networks has um, given her 96% accuracy in this kind of ship level classification. Um, and the exciting thing is that it can detect multiple simultaneous targets. So just to sum things up, um, I think I've convinced you that detecting sound amidst the noisy ocean soundscape is complex if you hadn't already had an appreciation for that by getting your hands dirty with this data, with different data already. Um, however, automation of detection and classification is critical for um, timely decisions that are being made um, by the military. A lot of groundwork has already been done at DRDC to um, plan and enable um, future machine learning and AI development. Um, we've done a lot of work building data sets and have just recently started um, on a simulation capability. Um, we've done a lot of work too, looking at um, which are suitable applications for machine learning and which ones are probably better left to, to, um, to the human experts. Um, our solution, particularly for marine mammals, is really a layer detection approach. Um, so that's multi uh, combination of multimodal data as well as integrating data from different data streams and different time scales. But I think the exciting thing about all of this is that we're now at a place where um, machine learning and AI is really at a point where it, it can start solving some of these problems which means it's, there are many opportunities for innovation and um, creative solutions to these complex problems. Thank you.